الحمد لله نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقرة من لساني يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علم آمين برحمتك يا رحم رحمين Honorable elders, brothers, sisters in Islam, all praise and thanks is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Choices, peace, blessings and salutations upon our master, Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the favors that he continues to bestow upon us and we ask of him that he make this gathering a blessed one and that when we leave from here, inshallah, that we leave with our sins having been forgiven and that we are spiritually uplifted and prepared for the week to come. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala overlook our shortcomings and grant us the ability to overlook the shortcomings of others. And may we be an ummah united under the banner of Islam, the banner of Tawheed, the banner of La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May we be from among those who understand and appreciate the value of our iman. May we, may we all be from among those who understand that the best thing that we've been endowed with, the best thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us and that, ca that He can possibly give us is to be bearers of the kalima La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May we be from among those who have the Qur'an in our lives, who have the Qur'an established in our lives, not only as a recitation, but as literally as a constitution. That which we decide what is right and what is wrong. May we be granted the ability, the tawfiq, to distinguish between right and wrong and to follow the, uh, the after. Allahumma arina al haqqa haqqa wa rzuqana tiba'ah wa arina al baatila baatila wa rzuqana jtinaba. Oh Allah, show us the truth as being truthful and grant us the ability to follow it and show us falsehood as being false and grant us the ability to abstain therefrom. Ameen. We continue with our discussion, inshallah ta'ala, around Surah Yusuf. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إذ قالوا لا يوسف وأخوه أحب إلى أبينا منا ونحن عصبة إن أبانا لفي ضلال مبين. الله تعالى says remember when the brothers of Nabi Yusuf said that verily Yusuf and his brother Binyamin they are أحب إلى أبينا منا. They are more beloved to our father than we are. وَنَحْنُ عُسْبَةً Whilst we, the brothers now, we are a strong group. إِنَّ أَبَانَا لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ Verily our father is in open strainers. Now this verse shows us a number of things. The first thing that stands out is rivalry among siblings. We, we uh, a husband and a wife, they have several children. And the children among themselves feel as though one or two is being favored over the rest. This is not uncommon. Now, whilst sometimes it is the fault of the parent in not being just with their kids, often it is simply a feeling that exists within the children themselves. The first thing we need to understand is this, that the emotion of love within the heart is something that, that exists out of our immediate control. We cannot control who we love more than others. It's something that exists in the heart. It doesn't have a switch or a button or a knob, a volume knob that we can turn it up or down. And this is clear from the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is well known from the narrations of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he loved, he loved Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha more than any of his wives to the extent to the extent that not only was she the only wife that he had during her lifetime, but way after her death, whilst he was married to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, even Aisha, who was the most beloved of his wives at that time, felt jealous of his love for Khadija radiallahu anha. She used to be so jealous because the Prophet wasalam, whenever he would receive something to give in sadaqah, he would say, Please send this to the friends of Khadija as a way of honoring her memory. At times he would remember her, he would recall her memory. And he would speak such beloved words about her that Aisha radiallahu anha being a human being and a lady at that, she became jealous and she said, 
Allah has granted you much better than an old woman. And the Prophet ﷺ became furious at this. Because Khadija radiallahu anha, he, she held a special place in his heart. He told Aisha radiallahu anha as a response. She believed in me when no one else believed in me. She stood by me when no one else stood by me. This is the rank that she has in my life. And Aisha radiallahu anha said she never said a word about her after that day. Now, even when we look at the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa after Khadija radiallahu anha, he used to prefer being with Aisha radiallahu anha most of the time. For example, when he would go on a journey, he would draw lots, you know, like you, you pick the shortest straw. He used to draw lots as to which wife would accompany him on the journey. But secretly he would hope that it would be Aisha radiallahu anha. So Allah Ta'ala most of the time allowed it to be Aisha radiallahu anha. During his last few days, during the days of his illness, as he was about to leave this dunya ila rafiq ila a'la to the best of companionship, to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he used to often mention Aisha radiallahu anha to the extent that the other wife said, it's okay. We leave our days, you can go and be with her. You can go and be with her. Now this shows us something. This shows us that even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was the most just of all human beings, he was extremely just. He was the personification of what it means to be just. An uprighteous being. Internally he felt love towards some more than he did towards others. However, Despite what I am saying, at every given moment in the life of our beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would never ever physically favor one over the others. If he gave the one wife a gift, he would make sure that he gave the other wives a gift just like he gave the one. Just as he spent time with Aisha radiallahu anha, he used to spend one night with each wife. And this would be in turns. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam would follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commands from the Quran which says, Aashiruhunna bil ma'roof, live with them in goodness. Live with them with that which is known to be good. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam used to be adil. I'adilu huwa aqrabu li taqwa. You need to be just because being just is closer to taqwa Allah. So whilst you can't control the internal emotion of love, the way we express our love externally must, and I emphasize, it must be equal and just for all of our family members and all of our children and all of our siblings. For example, if we have seven kids, you may find yourself loving one or two more than the rest. However, the love is one thing. As far as your spending on them, and your gifts towards them, and your treatment of them, and the time that you spend with them, this in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's law must be done in a just manner. Note I'm saying just and not equal. Because you cannot possibly do justice by being equal. For example, if you have seven children, the one child is a, is a one-year-old baby, the other child is 21 years old. You're going to give a thousand rand to the 21 year old, but are you going to give a thousand rand to the one year old child? Yeah, my son, yeah, you go buy yourself some nappies? No. If you're going to buy the one year old child diapers and, and uh, some milk, for example, or some, some food, are you going to buy the 21 year old child nappies and milk and food? No, this is insanity. So justice doesn't, is not the same as equality. Equality means you treat everything exactly the same. Justice means you give each individual his or her haqq. The Western world teaches us that there should be gender equality. That women and men must be the same and must be treated the same. Islam, and, I, and I'm going to emphasize this, it's going to sound a bit bad at first. Islam says that women and men are not the same, they are different. In fact, in the Quran, Allah says, وَلَيْسَ ذَكَرُكَ الْأُنْثَى The male is not like the female. Biologically, we are different. Psychologically, we are different. Emotionally, we are different. How can we possibly be the same? 
What a man wants and inclines towards is not what a woman wants and inclines towards. What Islam says is that in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, spiritually we are the same. Spiritually we are the same. Al mu'minina wal mu'minat. We are the same in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, spiritually. But physically, biologically, emotionally, psych psychologically, we are different. So Islam says there is gender justice as opposed to gender equality. Gender justice realizes that the man is strong, physically is strong. And he can endure working physically. And therefore Islam has placed the burden of responsibility of nafaka or taking care of the needs of the children and the wife upon the man. And not upon the woman, because she has not been built for this. Islam says that the man, if, if a brother and sister, if a brother and sister loses their parents, then in terms of the inheritance, the brother gets double the share of the sister. So the Western world says this is, this is unjust, because they must be treated equally. Islam says no, this is just, because they must be treated with justice. Because the lady, she doesn't have to spend upon herself. She doesn't have to spend upon her children. She doesn't have to provide food on the table. She doesn't have to put groceries in the cupboard. Her brother that earned double what she earned, he has to stand responsible for her with that double that he got and for his own family. Her money that she received is for her own self and for her own spending. She can go buy whatever it is, bags and shoes and things like that that she wants to buy. This is what Islam regards as justice. Now with regards to our children, we find that the brothers of Nabi Yusuf was jealous because they said, our brother, small, young, little Yusuf, and his younger brother, Binyamin, the two of them are more beloved to our father than we are. And listen to what they say, Wa We are a strong group. So they regarded their superiority in age, and perhaps because some of them were working and bringing money in, that they were better than their brothers were. Now, Nabi Yaqub loved Yusuf and Binyamin more internally, but he treated them all with justice. So they had no reason to feel that they should be jealous of Yusuf and his brother. But they felt this way. Because within them there was a problem. They looked at value in a material way. They saw that little Yusuf and little Binyamin, they can't, they're not strong, they can't bring in money, they can't stand for themselves, they are weak, so therefore they should be less loved by our father than we are. And the same thing happens in our world today. The moment we gain a rank of education above others, or a rank of popularity among others, or a rank of, uh, of, 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 of a position at, at one's work above others, then automatically we feel as though we are superior to others. We've been promoted, so we feel superior. We have our own company, so we feel superior. We have a degree, uh, you know, you move from a degree to, a, to, a, to a, a, a master's, for example, and then you feel su superior. Or you move up to a, a doctorate and then you feel superior. So we look at material things. We get a bigger house, we move to a better area, we get a better car, and we feel superior. We cannot, as Muslims, look at material things and regard that as the measurement of our superiority in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because wallahi, as believers... It's our duty to acknowledge that inna akramakum inda Allahi atkakum. That verily, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those who are the most taqwa. There's no rank for one over the other, for an Arab over a non Arab, for a white over a black, or for a black over a white. There's no such thing. The Prophet والسلام, would teach that we are all the same. And we should all be treated with justice. And on the day of Qiyamah, our souls will stand equally responsible in the sight of Allah, Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal. So because of their jealousy, because of this feeling that they had among one another, the brothers of Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam, they started devising a plot. And they said, Uqtulu Yusuf awitrahuhu ardan yakhlu lakum wajhu abikum wa takunu min ba'dihi qawman salihin. Listen, they said, kill Yusuf or throw him in a faraway land. Go and, go and throw him away, you know, discard him in some faraway land because he's young, he won't be able to find his way back. Yakhlu lakum wajhu abikum. Then your father will be, he will have a face for you alone. That's what it says literally. 
He will have a face for you alone. In other words, he will love you alone. He won't have time for his two brothers. Listen to the extent of what jealousy can do. Jealousy caused Iblis to become shaitan that we know today, ar rajim Because he thought that the malaika should be buying down to him and not Adam, alayhi salam. Jealousy caused the trouble between Habil and Qabil. Because the one sacrifice got accepted and the others didn't. And this led the one to kill the other one. This was of the first human beings on this dunya. Jealousy caused the brothers of Yusuf not only to say, not only to say that, you know, uh, let's find a way to, to get our father's love over our brother. No, they went to the extent of saying, let's kill Yusuf or discard him in some faraway land. My beloved elders and brothers and sisters in Islam, take note of the lessons that the Quran teaches us regarding the danger of hasad. Now let me emphasize, hasad is not wanting what somebody else has. You see somebody with a nice job or a nice car or a nice house or they are hafiz al-Quran or they are alim and you feel, you know, I want that for myself also. That's not hasad. That's perfectly fine. To want something that somebody else has, that's perfectly fine. Hasad. My dearest brothers and sisters in Islam, hasad is when we don't want that person to have it, we rather want it for ourselves. That's hasad. Where we feel, you know, I should have that, that person shouldn't have that. And what brings hasad about? Hasad is brought about by this quality known as kibr. Kibr is when we feel superior to others, when we look down upon others. Now the way kibr leads to hasad is that within ourselves we feel that I am better than this, than this particular individual, yet this person has knowledge, this person has uh, memorized the Quran, this person earned so much money, but I should be doing that, not this person. So because we feel superior to others, and we have kibr, therefore when others are favored and not ourselves, now we become hasad, we become jealous, we become hasid. And because we are jealous, because we are jealous, we start acting. We start acting inappropriately. How does the jealousy come out? How do you see it? The jealousy comes out through ghadab or anger. When shaitan felt that he was better than Adam for some strange reason, that was one thing. But when the malaika bowed down to Adam, now the jealousy, now the kibber started turning into jealousy because he felt he should have that and not Adam. How did the... How did the jealousy and the kibr start showing? It started showing because he became angry. He became ghadab. The anger showed. In fact, the one of the meanings of the word shaitan is to, to become infuriated. So shaitan became furious. These are how the three qualities of kibr, hasad and ghadab are interlinked. So next time you become angry, ask yourself, why am I becoming angry? I'm becoming angry because my wife spoke to me in a certain way. But why should I feel anger when my wife speaks to me in a certain way? Is it because I feel that she's less than me and she can't speak to me like that because I'm more superior than she is? So because she's inferior, she must speak to me in a certain way. And therefore I became angry because then that anger is an indication of the hasad and the kibr that exists within us. And to have kibr within us is something that we need to ask of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to rid us of because anybody with a mustard seed of kibr in their heart won't even smell the fragrance of Jannah. Wa na'udhu billah. Next time we feel jealous, ask yourself, how come I feel like I deserve it and this person doesn't deserve it? Is it because I feel better than this person? Is it because of those, those three very dangerous Arabic words, ana khayru min? Is it because of that? I am better than him? Is it because of that? Because it, if it is that, then we need to be very, very fearful. Next time we feel, we feel in a particular situation, angered or frustrated, or we feel within ourselves as though we would like to express anger, but we don't because we're controlling it, ask, why is this emotion building up? Because anger is an emotion of heat. And so is Hasad, and so is Kibir, and they are all interlinked. And the one, nine times out of ten, is an indication of the other. And this is explained in detail by Imamuna al-Ghazali, rahimahullah ta'ala, in his magnum opus, Ihya Ulum al -Din. Now, not only did the brothers of Yusuf say, let's kill him or throw him far away, they also said, وَتَكُونُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِ 
qawman salihin wa takunu min ba'dihi qawman salihin now here i would like to address everybody that finds themselves you know in a situation where they would still like to enjoy the glitz glamour and fun times of life myself included we all sometimes feel like you know us will not do and us will not die but these things might be haram because one thing that is common among human beings that are religious is that they say it's okay let's have our fun now just now we can make tawba and then we'll, everything will be okay again we still young right let's have a party let's have a good time us is not young there's a time and a place for everything one day and this is a common thing among the youth when we are 40 years old we will go on hajj and we will make tawba and then we will start coming right and then we will perform salah and then we will be good muslims this is exactly what the brothers of yusuf said what takunu and you will be min ba'dihi after you kill him or after you throw him away qawman salihin you will be righteous people you can just go and you can make tawba oh allah i'm sorry i killed him you know uh, it's a mistake please forgive me right i made tawba everything is okay now this is an illness for us to feel and it's a common thing it's a human feeling you know we, it's okay to make a mistake now we'll make up for it later Allah is teaching us here subhanahu wa ta'ala that it is an evil within us to feel that we can say it's okay to disobey Allah now I'll just make tawbah later it's a plot of shaitan to say it's okay to have a good time now and just play ignorant of the fact that what I'm doing is haram Jumu'ah will come and then I'll make salat till Jumu'ah will wake maghrib tonight and everything will be okay again It's an illness to think that I can go around and have girlfriends and make zina and do what I'm not supposed to do and you know what it's okay because Ramadan will come again and then I'll puasa and everything will be fine again. It's an illness to think that that type of tawbah is a sincere tawbah. Wallahi we are only fooling ourselves because if we may, we need to remember that the one who we think we are deceiving is the all knowing, the all wise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal, the creator of everything, knows us better than we know ourselves. So how can we think for a moment that we are deceiving Allah by saying, you know, it's okay, I'm going to do this now, I'm going to catch on my nonsense now, and then later on, I will just make tawbah and turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah protect us, may He protect our children, may He protect the youth, because this is something that is common in society. You thinking that, you know, because we are young, our parents were young, they also did it, It's okay to just do whatever we want to because we are youthful and you know we will come right we will become adults look at the buddhas in the masjid they all when they become old they go to the masjid so we're going to do the same allahu akbar walillahi alhamd do we have a guarantee that allah ta'ala will allow us to see tomorrow do we have a guarantee that allah ta'ala will allow us to see the age of 30 or 40 or 50 ask any person that has reached and a pensioner's age let me put it in that way Ask any person, they will tell you that they are grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for having reached that age. And every day is a ni'mah for them. When they wake up in the morning, somebody that, who has gone through an illness, who has fought a disease, who has been hospitalized, who is living with some illness, this person wakes up every day thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not because it's a ritual, Alhamdulillah, ladhi ahyana ba'dama amatana wa ilayhi nushur, no. Because they genuinely feel grateful that, Ya Allah, I shukr I thank you for giving me another day another day to worship you another day to be thankful to you and wallahi despite the age you will find that they all regret whatever they may have done in the in the so to speak what we refer to good old days which isn't good at all it's constantly a means of regret you know it's constantly a means of regret and I've wallahi I've heard so many elderly men tell me You know, I was naughty back in the day and, and you know, I'm so grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing me to live and to come right and to be in the masjid and make salah. And they will walk to the masjid despite having cancer throughout their body. They will walk to the masjid just to say, thank you Allah for granting me another day to make up for the mistakes that I once upon a time did. So let us not be deceiving ourselves and say, وَتَكُونُ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ قَوْمًا صَالِحِينَ You will be after that a righteous people. قَالَ قَائِلٌ مِّنْهُمْ لَا تَقْتُلُوا يُوسُفَ وَأَلْكُوهُ فِي غَيَابَةِ الْجُبْ يَلْتَقِتُهُ بَعْدُ السَّيَّارَةِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ فَاعِلِينَ One of them said, don't kill Yusuf, rather throw him 
in the, in the bottom of a pit, of a deep well. Then some travelers can pass by, pick him up, and they can go away with him if you really are going to do something. This is another thing that youngsters do. They say, you know what? Let us not zina. Don't zina, because that we know that's a bit of a bad thing. So let us do everything else but zina. So let's just do the lesser of two evils. This is another plot of shaitan. You know, or, the, or shaitan comes to you and he tells you, ah, it's okay that you are doing this. You know, and you're going clubbing and things like that. At least you're not drinking. Or you drink, and then shaitan comes to you and tells you, ah, it's okay that you're drinking, you know. At least you're not doing it in the open. Or shaitan will come to you and tell you, ah, it's okay that, you, that you're doing pornography, or that you're doing narcotics, or that, you, that you're involved in gangsterism, because at least you're not doing that, and at least you're not in prison, and at least you're not rude to your parents, or something of the other. There's always justification by Iblis. He's always going to make you try and feel that the evil that you're doing is nothing. Remember, for the salih, for the righteous person, small sins, big sins, it doesn't matter. For the righteous person, their sins feel like a mountain that's above their heads, that's about to collapse over them. For the person that has been deceived by shaitan, the sins is like a fly on the nose. They just brush it away every time, brush it away every time. It's just like a mere irritation. All they need is one Jumu'ah, or one Maghrib, or one day of fasting for them to just brush it away and feel righteous about it again. They said, قَالُوا يَا أَبَانَا مَا لَكَ لَا تَأْمَنَّا عَلَى يُوسُفَ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَنَاصِحُونَ They went to their father and said, let him go with us. Why? What's wrong with you that you don't want him to go with us? When we are sincere advisors for him. They said, أَرْسِلْهُ مَعْنَا غَدَيْ يَرْتَعْ وَيَلْعَبْ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِذُونَ Send him with us tomorrow. We will play and we will eat and we will protect him. And then Nabi Yaqub said that it grieves me. Qala inni la yahzununi an tadhabu bihi wa akhafu an yaakulahu dhibu wa antum anhu ghafilun. It saddens me that he should go with you. Lest something bad happen. Whilst you are doing something, you'll be unmindful and a wolf might come along and eat him and attack him and eat him. Now Nabi Yaqub was looking for an excuse so as to prevent them from taking Yusuf, because he understood their jealousy. And this shows the importance of a parent understanding the nature of his or her children. It's important that we understand that they are different, that they are human beings. And it's important that we don't be like some parents, they say, you know, not my child. My child will never do that. My child won't fall into zina. I've raised my child properly. Is your child not a human being? Is your child not part of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is it not true that if you take a north pole of a magnet and a south pole of a magnet and you put it like that and you say, yeah, the two of you can be close together but you mustn't touch, eh? Don't touch, right? You mustn't be attracted to each other because I raised you properly. No. The north pole is immediately going to touch the south pole of the magnet because that's how they were created. Just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the male and the female. This is why nikah is such an important part of our deen. If a boyfriend and a girlfriend are going to be going out together, if they're going to be alone together, no matter how pious you may think they are, they are still human beings. No matter what type of upbringing or education you may have given them, for you to think and say, well, not my child, my child will never do that, is deception. Because Allah created them. And Allah didn't say they can be together but they mustn't make zina. Allah said, La taqrabu zina. They mustn't even go into a position of being close to zina. Subhanallah. So this surah is teaching us that. Nabi Yaqub wants to prevent the situation altogether. So he says to them, because he knows them, I fear lest the wolf is going to eat him. But being evil because of shaitan, not because they were evil within themselves. Being evil and listening to shaitan's evil. They went. And they did exactly what their father said is going to happen. They used his excuse as a means to deceive their father. So they threw Nabi Yusuf in a well. And they took his shirt. They took his shirt off. They dipped it in some sheep's blood or some false blood. 
they went back to the father and they said, Oh, my father. And they came crying. They came crying. Isha and at night. Yabukun, crying. Oh, our father. You know, we would tell you that the wolf ate him, but you wouldn't believe us. This is how they come out. We would tell you that the wolf ate him and that, and that uh, you know, what you said is going to happen. Happen, but we know you're not going to believe us. Listen to how children can potentially manipulate their parents. No, I'm going to a sleepover. No, we're just going to go out to the mall. We're just going to have a good time. No, we're just friends. We're not boyfriend and girlfriend. We're just friends. You know, it's just innocent, right? And then, Allahu Akbar walillahi alhamdulillah. In a matter of seconds, young innocent children become children who committed tantamount to murder. It's attempted murder. They threw him down a well. They threw him down a well. And they left him for death. And in that situation of loneliness, and this is where we end, in that situation of loneliness, because Nabi Yusuf was a righteous child. He was a child that feared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was a child that respected and loved his father to the extent that he wouldn't even say, Daddy. He says, Oh my beloved Daddy. He says, Ya Abati. Because he was that type of child, despite being five or six years old, in the darkness of a well, Allah ta'ala says, that فَلَمَّا ذَهَبُوا بِهِ وَأَجْمَعُوا أَنْ يَجْعَلُهُ فِي غَيَابَةِ الْجُبْ وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْهِ And we gave him wahi. As a child, Allah says, we granted him inspiration. لَتُنَبِّئَنَّهُمْ بِأَمْرِهِمْ هَذَا You, O oh Yusuf, one day you are going to inform them of this thing that they did to you. In other words, you will survive this loneliness. You will survive this well. You will survive it, and not only that, you will one day be in a position to tell them, remember what you did to me? In other words, you will gain a rank over them. This is what Allah tells him. A little boy of five or six years old. وَهُمْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ And they won't even perceive it. Now what's the lesson in all of this? And this is something that I would like us all to take home, inshallah. Because we are living in, in times that are potentially depressing times. You see what's happening to the ummah, what's happening around the world, what's happening in our very own city. You just put on the news and all you see is bad news. Right? In terms of finance, economy, everything just looks a bit glim. I would like us all to remember this as the lesson, as the lesson of, of the Jumu'ah for this week. It is that look at Nabi Yusuf. He had nothing. He had nothing with him in the darkness of a well. All he had was Allah, and Allah was enough for him. He had nothing at all. No money, no ladder, no torch, nothing, no cell phone. All he had was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his mind and in his heart, and Allah was enough for him. حسبي الله لا إله إلا هو عليه توكلت وهو رب العرش العظيم Enough is Allah for me There is no deity, there is no God worthy of worship But He Upon Him do I place my trust And He is the Lord of the majestic throne And how does this matter to us in our lives? Jama'at al-Muslimin When the whole world turns their back on you when your family turns their backs on you, when your friends turn their backs on you, when your employees or your employers turn their backs on you, when the, when the community turns their back on you, when, when the whole society seems as though they don't care about you and you feel alone and you feel like there's no hope, all you need is Allah in your life and Allah will be enough for you. As long as your relationship with Allah is a sincere one, and like the innocence of five-year-old, six-year-old Yusuf, you know that Allah has power over all things. And just like Allah allowed you to get into that situation, it is only Allah, when you turn to Him, it is only Allah, Rabbul Izzati Wal Jalal, that can take you out of that situation. My dua is that Allah be with every Muslim, male and female, despite the difficulties that they may be going through, whether it be in Syria or in Egypt or in Palestine or the Middle Eastern countries or Somalia or Kenya or Nigeria or Congo or anywhere in Africa or anywhere in the world or in Cape Town. Everybody that's going through difficulty, may Allah be with them and may they never lose hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it is only the one 
that loses hope in Allah, it is only that one that has destroyed themselves. لا تقنتو من رحمة الله Never lose hope in Allah's mercy. إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا Allah forgives all sins. إنه هو الغفور الرحيم He is the most forgiving, the most merciful. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد والحمد لله رب العالمين.